Okay, well, the first question is the biographical question. You can take yourself living by the question. You give us a lowdown on the kind of such interests that you have to deal with. The biographical question. Of course, as I would believe, if you can adequately reconstruct uh, the past, uh, much less uh, one's own, I mean, the difficulties of constructing, reconstructing the past. Um, already, I would respond by putting in parentheses, right, there, under quote, in quote marks, uh, the very notion of biographical enterprise. But um, as I recall, as I remember my life, <laughs> uh, it has, it, it uh, how did I get into history? Is the question, right? Uh, how did I get in? And beyond that, how did I get into meta history? <laughs> how did I slip into meta history? And uh, the the uh, answer to that question is um, a typical socialist realist uh, kind of uh, uh, 30s kind of uh, scenario. Uh, born to working class family uh, in the southern United States, who went to Detroit. Uh, the manufacturing center during the depression uh, to find work and uh, raised uh, exposed in school to uh, uh, make aware of class differences in a way that i wouldn't have been had i not been uh, someone coming from a, a, a relatively integrated uh, southern cultural background i was the southerner in this northern environment so that plus uh, then the urban environment, a uh, place of great racial tension, Detroit, uh, race riots in the early 1940s I think, uh, occurred very near the Navy in which I was. And uh, going to public school, uh, going to the uh, city uh, university, Wayne State University, the college, where I discovered history. I mean, and it was an object of fascination for me. So why would anyone be interested in the past? Uh, since the notion of tradition is a mystery for me as well. And so I became as interested in why people study the past and what ideological uses is made in the study of the past. Um, as much interested in that as I was in finding out what the past uh, was all about. And is that well, I was governed in those days by uh, <clears throat> socialist uh, ideology, socialist conviction. And uh, part of the kind of uh, ideology critique uh, enterprise uh, in a kind of social science mode. That's the way I did history. But I, I studied the subject. I studied was medieval history, which would be a strange thing. But uh, I recall that uh, we led into that by uh, the figure of Max Weber uh, as a kind of model, and Weber had you know, begun as an ancient historian. With medieval studies and that sort of thing. And, but uh, I had a teacher who got me interested in, that, in the Middle Ages. How could anyone live in that kind of cultural dispensation? How could it sustain itself for a thousand years? That was the question that drove me out. And I found out that most of the people who were studying the Middle Ages believed in it. So I uh, recognized that I couldn't work comfortably in that as a professional historian. So I increasingly turned to the study of the ideology of history. History itself, not as an antidote to ideology and a demystification of ideology, but the way his, historical knowledge and information are used in the construction of ideology. So that that contrast between ideology and uh, history with the one thing serving as uh, um, history serving as this ideology serving as a distorted version of what was offered in this pure form in historical reconstruction, that collapsed, that distinction collapsed. And that's what led me into this whole question of thinking about the rewriting, uh, writing and rewriting uh, of the past and in, in the philosophy of history. That's it. Mm -hmm. Sweet. John. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do you want to talk about uh, one of the two things? Yeah. Uh, who are you studying? 
12th century church history. Uh, I was studying uh, administrate. It was administrative history. It was the papal administration, and what I was studying was the uh, overthrow of the Gregorian party in the um, uh, 12th century papacy by the forces, the Cistercian reform forces. It was a it was papal politics, but curial politics, the po politics of the curia, which had just been. Uh, which had just been formed really by the Gregorian party, the Cluniac's uh, order. The Cluniac order was the uh, dominant force in curial politics. But in 1133, they had a, uh, an overthrow, I mean, a, a, a deposition of one of the popes, Anacletus II. And uh, behind this uh, revolution, the deposing of a pope and the installation of Innocent II, uh, as, the, as the real pope, and the disputed papal election led to the revolution, was were the, were the Cistercians uh, and St. Bernard of Clairvaux and a whole group of, uh, of, of uh, anti cluniac they, were, they, were, they represented different cultural politics, among other things, that had to do with church architecture, uh, decoration, uh, attitudes towards uh, printed texts as against oral uh, tradition, so forth. So, and all these things converged here in a political form. So that's what I was studying there. And I did it for two years, it was very pleasant. It was very pleasant years. <laughs> and then from there on, I, you were writing history at that time. I was writing history. But I was but I but the first stuff I published was on philosophy of history, but on people like you know, R.G. Collingwood and uh, Christopher Dawson and Kurocha and uh, Toynbee, people that sort of stuff. I was always interested in the relationship between history, historical research, and philosophy of history. Uh, and what I began to see is that the similarities, I mean, among historians, uh, the orthodox view is that history is one thing, philosophy of history is a distortion in the mode of a reduction of the of historical reality. Um, it's highly it's believed to be a highly conceptualized and abstract uh, rendition of the historical record for uh, ideological purposes. I, uh, I increasingly came to the view that these qualities well, were different in form. Uh, the formal attributes uh, were different. Um, that there was no real distinction at the, at the semantic level uh, between the two genres of historical reflection. So that this commonplace, which for me, every history presupposes a philosophy of history. And every philosophy of history presupposes a certain body of historical information uh, that um, justifies its um, uh, implotment uh, of the data in the way in which you do it at a very high level of abstraction, say, as Hegel does, or Marx and Engels do in the uh, Communist Manifesto. And it appears that you're doing it in a concrete, in, greater, in a much greater detail in a microscopic study of a discrete historical period, richly detailed, richly elaborate. But in reality, the formal attributes of the semantics of the two uh, representations are much the same. So that I, I wanted to collapse that distinction, not fully, any more than I wanted to, want to collapse the distinction between narrative and description. But these become emphases within discourses, ways of in, uh, different kinds of emphasis rather than a polar opposition uh, or activity. When you're reading history, there's always a kind of a reality that that's, uh, that's generated by the text. We've seen what you're in the 17th yeah. century. Um, I mean, in your book, you more or less, or in your work, you more or less try to figure out how that reality is best to uh, produce. produce. Yeah, and, sure. Uh, that gives, and takes you into a kind of a study of rhetoric. It takes you into the study of rhetoric. It takes you into the kind of thing that uh, Roland Bach uh, uh, discusses in his essay called The Reality of Fact. What's the function of the detail that give, that's there and uh, provides information but doesn't have any other function, apparently, in the text? But, um, the, the aberrant detail in the fictional text gives the reality of fact. Now, what's the, that is to say, it, uh, it, it nails down uh, the events uh, in, in reality, the small door behind Charlotte Corday. Why is it, why is why does Michelet give us the information that it's a small door? Uh, why not just say a door? Um, he says 
small adds a detail uh, that doesn't have any other function than to say this is concrete. And um, now, what's the equivalent in historical representation? I think that what you get, that, that what we would call a reality effect in history uh, is produced by taking uh, what we would call um, um, concrete uh, entities and putting them within a frame that is recognizably the, 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 the found in as patterns of coherence in literary or poetic material. So, and and the, what the, um, when you say you feel like you're in the 17th century, well, of course, the question is, how would you know, you know that this was what the 17th century? It's like saying, you know, someone who's dead, um, he looks like he's sleeping, right? Um, how would you know that he's old, he's not sleeping, he's dead, you feel it. Uh, but when you say, this is what it felt like to be in the 17th century, uh, you're taking it sort of on the word of the expert who studies the 17th century and knows presumably what it felt like to be in the 17th century. But you're also, uh, you, what is being addressed are certain fantasies. I mean, I think uh, having to do with feelings of nostalgia, of, um, uh, of uh, temporal distance, of exotic, the exoticizing effect. One of the things that history always does is uh, play upon uh, our desire to, to, to familiarize the unfamiliar. And it does it always by showing you how different the 17th century was than how like our own time it was, but also ultimately how inalterably different it was. And that effect, that effect uh, is what we would mean, I think, by the feeling that we could say, would say, oh yes, that's what the 17th century felt like, even though it makes no sense at all to say that you could say what the 17th century felt like. There's another distinction in the notion that was between facts and events, which I thought was very uh, enlightening for me. Can you sort of uh, go over that? Well, I, I, was, uh, I was commenting on the um, I was commenting on the uh, Confusion that one often uh, hears um, in discussions of um, um, the distinction between the factual discourse and fictional discourse, in which they will say, "Well, history is characterized by um, the recounting of facts that actually happened." And um, I was remarking that at the uh, outset of Scott's uh, novel, *The Heart of Midlothian*. Uh, Scott uses that expression, facts, that, or puts it in the mouth of one of the uh, framing characters. Facts that actually happen. And uh, the locution, real fact, concrete fact, and so forth, uh, is actually, I think, uh, intends to talk about not facts, which are, after all, verbal uh, constructions, predications, and, 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 and belongs to, I would say, to the order of words, not to the order of things. Um, except as far as the linguistic things, uh, that uh, uh, the the event is what happens. Facts don't happen. Facts are made. They're constructed uh, as predications, as linguistic entities. Uh, events, in one sense, are not uh, constructed. They happen. We can say that they happen. And uh, but the relationship between the fact and the event is that the fact is a statement about the event. So you, it, it's improper. It, it, it suggests confusion here. So I, it turns out, however, that one of the reasons this, this slippage occurs, I think, in discussions about the distinction between factual and fictional discourse, I think the reason this uh, confusion occurs is that uh, uh, we don't have a theory of the event. Uh, I mean, uh, science has no interest in the individual event. It's only events as belonging to a class of phenomena that uh, any given event would be interesting. And replicable events under laboratory uh, procedures. So the historical event, by definition, is individual, individualized, uh, or particular. Um, there's no such thing as a universal historical event. It makes no sense to say that. Uh, you can say that there's a universal event uh, in science, like entropy. I mean, it's an ongoing event that will go on forever until 
we have the entropic uh, condition perfectly realized. So, um, but we won't be telling that story. Uh, but uh, uh, when it comes to trying to theorize how historical events differ from natural events, it's very difficult to do. I mean, what are the attributes of the specifically historical event? It's hard to say. And uh, I think the reason that uh, history lends itself to narrative representation is precisely because we have this enigma of the, of the event, which unlike the natural event, is not re reproducible in the present, therefore under laboratory conditions, uh, and is not directly perceivable, it is known only by evidence or by its effects. Uh, and therefore, it's, uh, it appears to be the kind of happening, the historical event, insofar as it's located in the past, and what we mean by that is it's no longer something we can go and observe. Uh, nor can we, as in the scientific events, um, simulate adequately uh, historical events under laboratory conditions. So this leads to uh, um, the, the, construal, the only way the event, the historical event can be construed is an, as an enigma. As an enigma. Uh, and uh, a mystery. Uh, and it's the mystery of individuality, I would say, of individualization. Uh, the mystery of individualization. That's what Schopenhauer said was the great the metaphysical problem, right? The cause of all suffering. But in any event, to theorize the individual event, historical event, as in the past, and therefore not perceivable, as being only one of a kind and not repeatable, and at the same time, an object of knowledge, possible knowledge, gets you into this very strange relationship uh, that creates the historian's problematic that he or she solves by interrogating this event from as many different uh, aspects as possible or perspectives as possible, and then reconstructing it under the odor of some kind of pattern of coherence of, of a narrative kind, let us say. Uh, patterns, uh, code, we may say, that are most fully realized in their perfect, most, most perfect form in literary history. That's it, it seems to me at least. Uh, let's shift here for a second. Okay. Uh, you mentioned Foucault and immediately in my mind uh, the body. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> uh, what is your opinion on as to why this uh, reclaiming of the body? At this point in time, so well, it's very simple to me. The 20th century has too many bodies. <laughs> the world has too many bodies. Um, you know, more people are living now than have lived in the whole history of the uh, human race. Uh, that's one thing. Overpopulation, um, starvation, scarcity. Two, the techno what technology does to the to the body. Um, I think it's not only a quantitative difference in our capacities to kill and maim and mutilate. Uh, but uh, qualitative uh, death, as Johannes Fabian says in the famous essay, that how others die. And death is something that happens to other people. Uh, you need to observe your own death. Uh, but uh, you, you, it, it's poked in your face uh, in the 20th century in, in, with images uh, of uh, dead bodies, dying bodies, starving bodies, mutilated bodies. Incinerated bodies in, in, in the Holocaust. I saw some statistics yesterday. Uh, the average, the, the average number of males murdered in the United States is four to seventy-four times greater than the number of male average number of males killed in any other country. Seventy-four times greater than the number of males. Uh, let us say your chances are, and as for uh, black males. In the United States, murder is, uh, I think, a reflection of, uh, caused in large part by the atmosphere created by the horrendous uh, powers of destruction that uh, modern technology provides. Uh, the byproducts of that technological mechanism in the forms of poisons, uh, atmosphere, uh, the production of new kinds of disease, of which uh, cancer is one, and uh, probably caused by the conditions of matter and so forth. Plus the, the very prospect of the destruction of the earth, or life, or human life. 
I think that um, I think that uh, the vulnerability of the body uh, raises those questions. It leads Foucault into construing the history of the body in terms of uh, uh, the history of different kinds of cares. How do you care for the body, right? Conceived under these idealist terms in ancient Greece and Rome, um, stoic notions of exercise and so forth, um, different uh, ways of construing the body. But also, I think it has to do with the fact that uh, in our time, uh, we recognize, and, and this is part, in part a result of feminist uh, uh, attention to gender uh, studies, that uh, one's body is a construction. That it, uh, so when people talk about the body, and feminists say, whose body? Uh, what they're saying is that the body is a social construction. I mean, it may have a material base, a physiological basis, but uh, the image of the body that we carry around with us, and is, which is the subject of so much anxiety, when we reflect on the vulnerabilities and, and uh, the prospect of mutilation that can occur with it, uh, that's an imago. I mean, that's a, uh, that's a, uh, that's a construction. Uh, just uh, on the point of something else, uh, the interview John Pierce from uh, I don't know if you know. Yeah. But, uh, he uh, essentially um, talked about the care of the body and he made some point about disciplining the body. Yes. Uh, that essentially uh, discipline is essentially what counts, but not necessarily ideology. Uh, that if we could discipline the body, um, then it doesn't matter what the person thinks. Mm -hmm. So we should uh, really look at the way uh, mode of discipline as opposed to look at ideology. Well, but remember that whole discourse about ideology derives from uh, uh, Althusser's great essay on ideological state apparatuses, which says there are two kinds of discipline. That is, say, ideology, and the ideological state apparatus, and then the the, um, what we call it, the police state apparatus. Let us say, on the one side, uh, you have a discipline by interjection of the codes uh, sent out by the dominant uh, order to, above all, to, the, to its own members as well as to, uh, to the subordinate uh, classes. Uh, this is reinforced by threats of violence, uh, imprisonment, uh, and, and, and physical uh, discipline. The ideal, it was, and under Foucault's notion, was to get the subject to interject, to become self-disciplining, right? Now, uh, Fisk may be right about this, but I've always seen uh, what uh, Foucault's great uh, contribution is, was to this. That is to say, um, he, he, he raised the question, how can you really tell what is the, what is the actual ide ideology? I mean, after all, in any given period, there are ideologies floating around. Uh, why is, uh, what is the, the real effective ideology? He says, in order to find that out, for example, in order to find that out, uh, you have to go and look at the way, uh, you, you see that ideology always sets up some distinction between the, the, the licit and the illicit. Now he said that, and the justifications of the, of the distinction will be kept many different inflections, ideological inflections. What, though, is the dominant ideology? In order to find out what the real ideology is, the dominant ideology, in order to say, well, you've got this theory of, the, of legality, the legal subject, he says you go and look at what they do to people who break the rules. How do they treat them? How do they, do they lock them up? Do they beat them? Uh, do they try to re-educate them? You say it's, uh, and so forth. So that uh, it's this grooming and, and training process that uh, co coordinated with with the struggle of ideologies uh, that I found very interesting. For example, uh, attracted me to Foucault. For example, the book on madness. In one sense, he says, there's the ideology of reason. Then you have many different notions in the 17th century, 18th century, of what reason is. So, you know, a Lockean view, a Cartesian view, a Spinozistic view, and so forth. Uh, but what's the view that really prevails in a society? Well, what you do is you go and look at what they do to the people who are identified as not being reasonable. Now, how do they treat them? Do they lock them up? Do they exclude them? Do they whip them? And he says, look how, how, how they house them. And, and, okay, so if you go and you look at the prisons for the insane, that is the, the uh, place of uh, confinement of the insane, you find out that the modes, for example, of um, feeding them, 
are like those that you find in farmyards for the feeding of uh, feral animals, right? So that you know, you've got now the negative definition of what is the ideologically effective uh, 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 conception of uh, reason, which comes forth in this particular. So, and you do the same thing with any other value that is uh, that is um, projected. What does it mean to be, um, let us say, um, what the ideology of medical care? Right? Health. What is health? Well, in order to find out what the ideologically effective notion of health is in a given society, go and look at the way they treat you, people designated as sick. Uh, look at the way they will say. Well, this person is really sick, but that person is feigning sick. So, and see how they treat the two, you see. So, that always seemed to me the important contribution of Foucault, uh, an interesting way of, co of coordinating uh, thought and practice, you say, ideology and this disciplinary system. Uh, but the point was, for him as an historian of culture and society, of culture mostly, he's an intellectual historian. He was interested in, in tracking the history of ideas. He needed a criterion for selecting out among the welter of ideologies that occupy any given period or scene, the way of finding out what was the dominant ideology. Well, it's the one that's enforced by the law, but uh, that's one thing. But that may be what you have to do is find out who the exclude, how the excluded or demoted or what have been treated. Now, switch again. Look at the question on. Uh the distinction between structuralism and post-structuralism. Yeah. And you make the observation that uh, structuralism is more like Latin and post-structuralism is more like uh, uh, Greek, yeah. which reminded me of the uh, distinction that Heidegger made between uh, German philosophy and French philosophy. Right, yeah. Uh, <coughs> that's interesting. Uh, that's interesting. So, can you talk about that? Well, the, my, my point there was that uh, I, I was trying really to say, to suggest that they were similar too, you see, as well as different. After all, Greek and Latin belong to the same uh, language families. Uh, but uh, being archaic languages, we're able to sort of uh, uh, grasp their features a little bit more easily uh, than, uh, than uh, features that they have in common and uh, that they do not share. A little more easily than, than would be the case uh, if we said, well, structuralism is French and post structuralism is American. Like, what would that mean? It wouldn't be very helpful, I think, since the syntactical systems and the lex lexicons and so forth are, seem, appear to be so similar, right? Uh, in, uh, between, but uh, I've always been impressed by the idea that um, the very notion of the post. Um, is an interesting prefix, right? I mean, first of all, it's a kind of primitive uh, prefix. Uh, you have structuralism, then you have what comes after structuralism, uh, but the suggestion is that it's articulated as the perception of a flaw, of some inadequacy in structuralism, but you haven't yet, since you don't give a new name to this new movement, uh, you only can define it in terms of what it's repudiating, uh, you still don't know what the positive content of the uh, of the later phenomenon is. So I think we have to talk about the ways in which uh, the one requires the other, both as cultural movements and as concepts. Uh, well, the one requires the other as its own negative, uh, without being able to stipulate what the positivity is that they have uh, that they share. So that's an abstract way of uh, talking about uh, any movement. And this would only apply, really, to people who name themselves this way. I mean, to name yourself as a post structuralist is not to give a positive content. I mean, you're saying, I'm not that, right? Uh, which is the way, uh, which is the appeal, of course, of racism. I may not know what I am, but I am not that. I mean, that's the dialectic of uh, alienated uh, discourse, right? Uh, but, um, uh, to be more specific about the Latin Greek thing, I really had in mind um, a story that was told me by Danny Da about, um, and it, this derives from the fact that his important work, not only his work, but a lot of post structuralist work in France defines itself uh, as trying to grasp a mode of um, 
relationship to the world, uh, or art, uh, what have you, text, construed text, they liken it to the Greek middle voice, uh, which is a verb form, a grammatical form uh, that, uh, is, that Greek has that Latin doesn't have. And uh, the other difference between the two languages is that uh, it's the marvelously, it's the marvelous richness of the Greek verb uh, that uh, allows us to compare with the relative weakness of the Latin verb and the corresponding strength of the Latin uh, noun uh, and prepositional phrases and inflections and inflections and so forth. That uh, 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 seem to bear some relationship to the difference between scholasticism, scholastic theology, and mystical theology, where mystical theology has its origins in the West, Christian mystical theology, in the Greek fathers, and in uh, the Byzantine and the Russian mystical tradition, which has any effect. Or, and, or, uh, it's Irish uh, mysticism. Um, so we, what you've got here, I think, is a, a, a way of um, characterizing, metaphorically really, uh, what many people feel is this kind of mystical obscurantism of uh, certain kinds of the postmodernist uh, discourse, as in Derrida, the later work of uh, Roland Barthes. And to a certain extent in Foucault, everyone is, complains about the obscurity of uh, Foucault's style. And it's, 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 it's obvious that those three writers, while certainly valorizing, as we say nowadays, uh, clarity of expression, um, uh, also feel themselves compelled both to celebrate and actually practice a certain systematic obscurantism. Uh, reminding us always you can't say everything, right? And uh, that discourse is fragmented, it's broken off, it's internally inconsistent, it's undecidable, da 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 da. da. That is not, that's the language of, of, of the mystic in religion, a negative theology underlying mysticism. It's not the language of scholasticism any more than uh, structuralism resembles scholasticism. And this scholasticism envisions uh, a hermeneutic uh, system of analysis that answers all questions. All questions are answered. There is no need for a negative theology, or positive. So I think that difference is what I was trying to get at there. It was just a joke. But it's also the same distinction between code and poetic function. That's right. I, I extend it to the notion of whether you stress code or poetic function in Jacobsonian terms uh, in the discourse. And I think that post structuralism now, as represented by Danny Da from De Carlson, by the later Bart, the Bart who theorizes the punk and uh, studium uh, distinction in his analysis of, of photography. Um, the bark of the pleasure of the tax text and of the fragment of a lover's discourse, I mean, this bark. Um, Foucault, um, much earlier actually, in his work on Raymond Roussel and automatic writing, uh, his theory of the tropes, his own study of the tropes in the sections on the 18th century in uh, the Mons and the This version of post structuralism, which I wouldn't, and I think even Deleuzean. Uh, Deleuze and Guattari's theorization of the body without organs and uh, uh, nomad thought and uh, lines of flight and all that sort of thing. That that uh, that has um, uh, that that is a, a different modality of uh, thinking about the questions raised by structuralism. Did I lose the train of that thought? No. Uh, you know, oh, I know it was poetic function versus yeah. language. Yeah, one of the things I noticed about the semiotic conference here is that most of the semioticians really stress code function. I mean, they're all they're always fine, identifying codes, cross coding, trans coding, decoding, uh, over coding. Uh, but they're, they talk in terms of code. Very few of them talk in terms of poetic function. Uh, and yet, that was the thing that. Um, it really could be called uh, a greater contribution of the Occupson to structuralist thinking and how structures break down through overdetermination. See, overcoding is, is, is more of a poetic function because the metalinguistic function should result in 
more clarity, not over determination. So, okay. well, related to that is this notion of structuralism, this relationship between text and cognition. Strip away means and how um, many things means you see how it's constructed. And, and that's actually how it's coded. Not, and then the poetic function would be. Well, the poetic function, I mean, you recall that for, for, uh, for uh, Jakobson, that is a second principle of structuration that is more directed toward the provision of, of, uh, of patterns that are uh, less cognitively uh, semantic than visually semanticizing, orally semanticizing, and so forth. Uh, remember that for him, the poetic functions, for example, is manifested in meter, uh, rhyme, in formal poetry, uh, but also uh, the, all rhetorical emphases, all emphasis, repetition, things of this sort. Uh, repetition uh, is uh, for for the metalinguistic uh, analysis. Repetition is either noise or reinforcement. You see, uh, but it's not a rhetorical uh, category. It's not doesn't add new meaning. Uh, than that meaning, uh, but in, in uh, poetic, poetic or rhetorical terms, repetition uh, is uh, ad to, to When I re it's like when I answer a question with a question or with another question. Right? I mean, uh, that's a commentary on it. That's an answer to the question. You remember the joke? Why does it? Why do Jews uh, answer a question with another question? And then, why not? <laughs> and, um, let's go back to, to uh, history and to imagination and uh, um, imaginative reconstruction. Yeah. We talked about that. Yeah. And, uh, uh, how do you begin to talk about, you want to write about history? Where do you start? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, well, what's the relationship between what might call the analytical, uh, you know, waking analytical <coughs> interest of the historian and, um, and the object uh, which uh, is no longer there? I mean, how do you study an object that's no longer there? Those are these events that are in the past. Um, Paul Ricoeur, I cited Ricoeur, uh, third volume of his uh, Time and Narrative, as the place where he's discussing this. And uh, he says, uh, you know, we have to be able to imagine the object before we can construe it as a possible as a possible object of inquiry and analysis. So that what we usually mean by historical reconstruction uh, goes to a phase of prefiguration in which you imagine what the what it must have been like to live in the 17th century. And this constitutes living in the 17th century as an object of uh, possible knowledge that you can then allows you to um, um, uh, to have some model, you might say, or paradigm to allow you to, on the basis of which, by reference to which, uh, you could uh, know when you come upon a 17th century phenomenon. You see. Uh, recognition here would be uh, conformity of a body of materials to some paradigm that had been constructed imaginatively, and I, I used the, uh, I alluded to Kant's notion of the constructive imagination, and uh, to Collingwood's idea of the reconstructive imagination, and something like what was intended. Uh, so this would be a way of thinking about the relationship between the imagination on the one side, I mean, if we use faculty psychology terms, what do we mean by the imagination and, the, and historical imagination, historical critical faculty, analytical, historical analytics, historical uh, poetics? 